Shall we just have a prayer before we start? Dear Heavenly Father, these are words only which are written on paper, conveyed by reading. We ask you humbly that your Holy Spirit may attend each heart and that each heart may be opened to the message you would have us learn today. Help me as I present, dear Lord, and help the ground where the, the seed is sown. May your Holy Spirit attend us and may the name of Jesus be uplifted. In Jesus' name we ask this and for his sake. Amen. I actually started this sermon some months ago and I um, was to have presented it earlier in the year, in November actually, but of course now it's December. But um, while it's still this year, this still um, may be fresh in your memory, probably. On the 18th of, December, of September this year was what? The much-touted Scottish referendum, wasn't it? This question on the ballot paper, the questions on the ballot paper were simple. Either yes to Scotland becoming an independent country, or no to Scotland remaining within the UK. One had to make an X in the appropriate box, if you remember. Seems so long ago now, doesn't it? Leading up to the referendum, there were various depictions, especially on TV, as to what the Union flag would look like if the saltire of Scotland were removed from it. Also, there was a very cute, if not disturbing, cartoon illustrating the contour of the British Isles if the outcome of this referendum should be yes, voting for independence. It showed Scotland becoming detached at the Scottish-English border and Scotland and its islands drifting off into the Atlantic Ocean or off towards the Arctic or wherever the ocean currents would take us, leaving the rest of the British Isles looking extraordinarily different, as one would imagine. Maybe some of us would have liked to have drifted off to warmer climes. Who knows? Anyway, the reality is that we still remain attached geographically and literally to where we were before. But of course, other things are going to change. The people who made their decision in this referendum were the people living in Scotland. We were told that this decision about voting or not voting for independence was probably the most important decision we would make in our lifetimes. Many people all over the world were interested in the outcome of this vote, but it was only people actually residing here in the territory of Scotland who had the right to vote at this time. After all, they live and work here. It was because they belong here that they were deemed to have the best interests of Scotland uppermost in their minds, and so it was considered they would make the better decision. I have entitled my sermon, Belonging. What does that mean? Belonging is the continuous form of the word belong. I turned to the Collins English Dictionary, which incidentally was started here in Scotland in 1690, to look at the word belong. Some of the meaning of this verb are, one for instance, to be the property of, or two, to be bound to a person, an organisation, etc., by ties of affection, association, membership, etc. We think of people, ourselves included, as belonging, for instance, to our home, our nationality, our family, our spouse, our children, etc., this is a personal relationship with another person or persons and or a location, for instance, a home, culture, country, etc. Belonging is very closely related to the word longing. The noun part of longing is a strong feeling of wanting something. The adjectival form of this word means having or showing a desire. 
I associate this word longing with a yearning for something, be it an object, a place, a person or persons, or all these things. It has been considered by psychologists that it is very important for human beings to identify with a state of belonging. Years ago, I was in a position where I was attending psychology lectures. In this particular class, we were considering Abraham Maslow's pyramid of the hierarchy of needs. Pyramid like this. At the base of the pyramid, the psychologists said that human needs um, need to be met, like breathing, food, water, shelter, sleep, homeostasis, etc., with progression up to the pyramid, up the pyramid to the apex, where human achievement reaches its peak in morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem solving, etc. In order to reach the pinnacle of human achievement, it was first necessary to experience the level below, where human beings experience love and a sense of belonging in their lives. In other words, unless our basic needs are met, we cannot reach our full potential as human beings. This, I guess, might not always be the case, but it certainly helps us each in our daily lives if we don't feel lost and alone and that nobody cares about us. This, if this is how we feel, how can we achieve a goal in life? If that is the case and our lives are pointless, then psychological problems arise. One thing could be isolationism. For the purpose of this sermon, I would like to stress the need to belong either to another person or persons. My Maslow's hierarchy of the order of human needs may not mean very much to us, but there is in it a fundamentality. There is a yearning, a longing in each one of us to be somewhere with someone. When we achieve the situation where we have both the person or persons and the place where we belong, then we have reached our goal our ultimate destination, our home. With these objects achieved, we will have reached the pinnacle of human happiness. We will be home at last. A number of, I remember a number of years ago, something happened on one of my not-so-frequent trips from Australia back to the UK. Our plane had left Singapore, and we were heading northwest from there. We were flying for about an hour, and a meal was being served. Unusually, many people were refusing their meal, and I remember feeling very unwell, but I didn't know why. Then an announcement came from the cockpit of the plane, saying we were turning back to Singapore. There was a problem with one of the engines. The fact that so many of us were feeling unwell was to do with the sudden drop in altitude that had occurred. As we were landing back in Singapore, I could see out of the windows of the plane that fire engines were driving along the ground, keeping pace with the plane as we landed and cruised along the runway. They kept up with us until we arrived at the terminal. Maybe this was a routine for a returning plane, but it gave me a sensation, not only of the dramatic, but also a strange feeling of reality that maybe we could have been in big trouble. There we were all ferried off the plane to spend some time somewhere until our plane was repaired so that we could continue on our journey. At this time, I was teamed up with an English lady who had been visiting her daughter in Brisbane. We were given a nice room in an hotel, and after we had a short nap, we went out on the town to have a look at the shops and were given a nice free bus tour of the sites of Singapore by the airline we had been travelling with. I'm not going to give a commercial, but anyway. 
We drove around Raffles and went to a gem cutting factory and saw a beautiful tropical garden and some other places of interest. We had to return to the airport by 5 p.m. as our plane was scheduled to leave at 6. We got to the airport and were in a waiting room along with the rest of our co-passengers. We waited for ages. Our minds were working overtime as to just why it was taking so long for our plane to be prepared for us. You know how sometimes negative words seem to trickle through the babble of other conversations? Well, we heard such words of negativity coming from, would you believe it, a young Scotsman. <laughs> he was saying, I saw our plane coming out of its hangar, and when they got it outside, there was a problem with the wheels, and they had to pump up the tyres. Well, there was a collective groan from everyone there. I found out later that this usually is what happens anyway when a plane comes out of its hangars. They pump up its tires anyway. And how did he know it was our plane anyway? My friend beside me became quite dejected and all of a sudden I heard this rather plaintive lament coming from her. Now I know what it means to be a refugee. I feel that nobody wants us. Amazing, isn't it? How could such an experience of just a little hiccup in our travel plans cause such consternation, insecurity and distress? We were being well treated and had even seen more of Singapore than we would have expected. The ongoing journey was going to proceed we obviously did get home, or I wouldn't be here today, but I haven't forgotten it. It's definitely horrible to feel that you've been forgotten about, stranded, and can see no future before you. So many people in this world are wondering just what is happening around them, like the young TV man said to me the other week, didn't know what was going on in the world. How are we coping with the stresses of daily living with regards to our finances, relationships, leisure activities, security, etc.? How is our country, our continent, our world coping with the strain of 21st century existence? Then, of course, I nearly forgot one of our stresses, global warming. Some people might not be comfortable with this idea, but there is definitely something happening out there. A lot of people feel that things can't proceed the way they are going indefinitely. Somewhere, sometime, something is going to have to give. In order to know where we are going, surely we need to know where we came from. As I heard on a video recently, a young woman was saying that she needs to know the past, for instance, regarding her family's history, so that she would be able to plan her future, as much as one can plan one's future in this world. Knowing your own identity is paramount in knowing just where we are going. I remember years ago, there was a big effort for people to discover their roots, Especially was it important for people of African origin living in the USA when they were looking for where their ancestors came from in Africa. At that time, it seemed that it was really realised how vital it was for people to know their own origins. Going back even further than the not-too-distant past, where did our original human ancestors come from? It seems strange, at least to me, that the human race, in order to discover how man came into being, has to look outside this planet. NASA, which stands for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the US, are interested in and have invested heavily in projects in ozone depletion, earth science, the Big Bang Theory, and space exploration 
to name some of their projects. Scientists study the galaxies of planets and stars in their fantastic observatories and laboratories. A lot of this is just to find out how human beings came into being on this planet. They surmise that by knowing the basics of where man came from will give them a foretaste or be able to forecast where the human race is going. What a waste of time and effort and what an insult to the one who made us. They should just look into the mirror to see how fearfully and wonderfully they have been made or study nature and they might change their minds. They should have saved themselves <coughs> frustration and the planet billions or trillions of pounds by just reading their Bible. Let us have a look at some questions. What is man's origin? Or where did he come from? What, what's his family history? Or which family does he belong to? Where does he belong? Also, what is his final destination? The Bible tells me in Genesis 2-7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In the same chapter, we read of the creation of Eve from man's rib. Curious that God made man and woman about the same time. Again, in the New Testament, we read of Jesus in John 1, 3. It says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In the 10th verse, we read, He was in the world, that Jesus was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He, Jesus, made the world and everything. He came into the world but they didn't recognize him. In Isaiah 1, verses 2 and 3, we read, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. It was not just Israel who forgot their father, but the whole world. In 1 John verse, chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Behold, what manner of love the hath, Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Our Creator says to us in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. That means an end with expectation, something to look forward to. It was because of our original ancestors' sin in the Garden of Eden that the human race became estranged from God. God's great heart of love suffered something we as human beings will never understand. But he couldn't stop loving us because he, his character, is love. And I think this is something that it's so hard as a human being to understand sometimes that God loves us so much when we are so, so bad sometimes but it's something we just have to accept with both hands, his great love for us. We read of the plan of salvation in John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the verse after it, which reads, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the wor that the world through him might be saved. The whole Bible is about this love that cannot let us go and how Jesus paid for our sins and reconciled us to God, our Father. 
We aren't forced to accept his salvation, but we have always had a choice. If we look at Luke 15, um, I'm just going to refer to it. We, it was actually in our, part of it was in our Sabbath school lesson today. And it's the story of lost and found, isn't it? Story of lost and found. Um, the first um, few verses talks about the man who had a hundred sheep, the lost sheep. And he lost one of the sheep. And what did he do? He thought, well, I've got 99. I won't bother about this one. What did he do? He left them. But I'm sure he left them, the 99, he left them safely. It said he left them in the wilderness, but I'm sure he left them safe. And he went out and he found the sheep. He put it over his shoulder. He brought it home. And what happened then? He got his friends together and he said, the one that I lost has been found. And they all had a big celebration. And then there was, the next bit was about um, a woman she had uh, 10 pieces of silver and she lost one. Well, one. But no, it meant a lot to her. It was probably her dowry. She might have had 10 coins on a headdress that she wore, or it might have been sewn into clothes that she had or something. Anyway, what did she do? She went looking for it. She cleaned the house. Well, it probably was quite a clean house anyway, but it had got into a groove somewhere or whatever, and she found it. And then she called her friends and neighbours and they had a celebration because she said, the one I lost, I found. And then the last story is the most <coughs> widely known story, I think, in the world about the prodigal son. Prodigal means an extravagant person. He was an extravagant boy. Remember, he, um, there were a man who had t two sons and uh, the man must have been quite wealthy and the younger son couldn't wait for his dad to die so he could get the inheritance. So... He said to his father, he said, I want my inheritance now. So the father divided his property or gave him the allotment, I guess, of the second son. And this young man went off. So what did he do? He wasted all his money. He lost all his friends, and quotes, friends. And he was really in a, in a, a mess. He spent it all and there was a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he ended up looking after the pigs. So if this gentleman was a Jew, he would really not have liked this. And anyway, he was at the point where he wanted even to eat the, the carob pods or the, the food that the, the, the pigs were eating. And then it said he came to himself, and he thought about home, and he thought... How many of my father's servants, the hired servants, have food enough to eat and to spare, and I'm perishing with hunger? So he went off home. So what reception did he get when he got home? But dad said, you back again. No, he didn't. When he was still coming, the father was watching for him. And he ran to meet him, and they met. And he said... Um, he said, I'm no, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he, he you know, that, well, that's what he said to his father. He'd been rehearsing this before he got there, and it <coughs> all came out when he met his father. And the father said, oh, you know, he said to the servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and kill the fatted calf. And um, let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found. And they began to be merry. There is another bit to that about the other son. But this is all we're going to deal with today. All these were found. The coin, being inanimate, didn't know it was lost. But it was placed in a, the position it had previously occupied. The weary bedraggled sheep was restored to the safety of the sheep pen among its flock, and I bet it was glad. The prodigal son came home. He achieved his destination. He reached the place where he belonged. He was reunited with the father he belonged to and who belonged to him. He had his inner yearning for belonging fulfilled. The human race willfully left God but he came seeking what was lost, and he found and saved us. We were wandering around. Maybe we weren't even in a fit enough condition to wander around. But he came 
and hazarded his own person to save us. He was born, and of course we've just celebrated Christmas. He lived and died as a human being, and he was, he was resurrected as God. There is no security in this present world. Any happiness we experience here is only transitory. It is short-lived. If we are happy, we can be sure there are many others out there who are exactly the opposite. That is the nature of the world we live in. We have to want to belong to him. Nothing can separate us from his love if we desire to have it. The late Formula One Brazilian race, racing driver Ayrton Senna, who died tragically in the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix, was a committed Christian and he left quite a legacy to the poor young people of Brazil. On his tombstone are the words, Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Death certainly can separate us from the living, but God is immortal, and he controls time and space, and so very much more. Temporal things are only fleeting and will pass away, and one day will be no more. But God has so much more in mind for us. Every human being has this need of wanting to belong. If this need isn't fulfilled, then we are missing out on something wonderful. Abraham wandered in the deserts, living in tents, and he was given a wonderful promise by God regarding his descendants, even when he was still childless. The promise was given of the, promise, of the land of promise where they would live, but in the end, Abraham realized that it wasn't an earthly home he was looking for, but a home created by God. A heavenly home was what he wanted because he was just a wanderer and a pilgrim on this earth and he was looking for a heavenly city prepared for him by God. And we are wanderers and pilgrims on this earth. I just said that to myself today. Not, nowhere in this world is home for me. Any promise that was, and there was a promise also given to him by God, which was paramount to everything and every dream that he and his descendants and us could ever have. Because in Genesis 22, verse 18, Abraham was told, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. This was referring to his descendant, the God-man, Jesus Christ. The human race was redeemed by him and saved from eternity. It was all possible through Jesus. It was foretold that the kingdom of Jesus would be an everlasting kingdom, and indeed it is. In order to be completely whole, let us tell Jesus we love him and we'll want to belong to him. And to complete the picture, let us lay hold of the promise in John 14, 1 to 3, when Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The city God prepared for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those who lived in tents, as well as his children who just trust in him, is the new Jerusalem. In Revelation 21, we read about this new Jerusalem. And it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And then it says, in this new heaven, new city, that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow. Okay. 
There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And we read too that there shall be no more night there, and that, that this is the home that God has prepared for us. When we have all our deepest longings, and I dare say it, even our desires met, we will be complete individuals. God made us, he created us. He has borne with us all this time, and he definitely knows what is good for us. As human beings made in the image of God and having gone astray, we are only really fulfilled when we are home where we belong, with our loved ones who belong to us and to whom we belong. As Ayrton Senna experienced and as it states on his tomb, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Jesus was God with us. Let us ask God that God will be with us today, and when Jesus returns, we will continue this relationship for eternity in, shall I say it, more advantageous circumstances. Voting in the Scottish referendum wasn't the most important decision we will ever have to make in our lifetimes. There are two choices before us. Even, even um, Pilate said, what would you that I would do with this Jesus who is called the Christ? We have this choice. What will we choose? Dependence upon God? Or do we want to do our own thing? The choice is ours. I know which box I have crossed. May God give us grace to make the right decision and to be faithful to it. Amen. Surely, dear Lord, when you come again soon and you call for us, indeed our hearts will be filled with gratitude and love and thanks. We thank you that you are a God of love, a God who doesn't give up on us, but a God who loves us with an everlasting love. So be with us, Lord, as we leave here. And may we take your heart, your love in our hearts, to shed to each other and to shed to everyone we meet. So we thank you for your great love to us. So accept us, Lord, in the name of him who died for us. And may your Holy Spirit be with us, each one. In Jesus' name we ask this and for his sake. Amen. Amen.